So um, let me introduce our speaker. Gary, you could slowly make your way to the podium while I embarrass you a little bit. So I'm delighted to introduce to this council the newly arrived director of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, uh, Gary Gibbons. Um, uh, by way of some biographical background, Gary was the founder and recent director of the Cardiovascular Research Institute and chairperson of the Department of Physiology and Professor of Physiology and Medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine, Atlanta. Prior to joining the Morehouse School of Medicine in 1999, Gary was a member of the faculty at Stanford University from 1990 to 1996 and at Harvard Medical School from 1996 to 1999. He's originally from Philadelphia. He earned his undergraduate degree from Princeton University and graduated magna cum laude from Harvard Medical School in Boston. He then completed residency and cardiology fellowship at Harvard-affiliated Brigham and Williams um, in Boston. I'd also point out where I most specifically got to know Gary was as a member of the Board of Scientific Counselors overseeing our intramural research program, um, where uh, it was just wonderful to have him help us on our intramural program and get to know us. Um, and, uh, and, and that was a, a great introduction. And then when uh, Francis was successful at uh, convincing him to come take this important leadership position, we all cheered loud uh, at NHGRI. It's wonderful to have a good friend and colleague at the helm of that important institute. And, uh, and it's wonderful to have Gary here today uh, to, do, to give a bit of an introduction. And I already know there's going to be some interesting discussion of things we want to talk to you about. Gary. OK, great. Well, thanks, Eric. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. I do feel as though I'm um, coming back to talk to family to some extent, to the degree to which uh, uh, we uh, engaged uh, this institute in the BSC. And uh, I thought I'd paint a, a broad uh, picture, predominantly at the 25,000 foot view of what we're seeing in my first six months of, about a strategic vision and uh, hopefully uh, a lot of opportunity uh, for collaborative sy uh, synergy with genome, uh, uh, again, based in part on shared interests. Um, uh, first, uh, that, that part of uh, the conversation I had uh, with Francis, uh, when uh, uh, particularly people in this group would know how compelling and convincing Francis can be. Uh, uh, when it came to uh, thinking about taking on this position, particularly in such a challenging time as uh, we're in. Uh, but it resonated uh, uh, it, with my sense of, of purpose uh, and commitment to service. Uh, I very much have bought into uh, the mission of the NHLBI uh, as a longtime investigator and advisor and council member. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly as part of my career development as a physician, uh, as a scientist, uh, as an educator, and as someone uh, committed to public service, I, I do consider this a privilege uh, to join the ranks of, of such a great organization. Uh, and I'm, I'm reminded uh, that in this uh, role of public service, uh, it's one of stewardship. Uh, and uh, I, I, I took to heart this quote, uh, it's a Native American proverb uh, that um, reminds me of our stewardship uh, both of the scientific enterprise and the biomedical workforce uh, that we're stewards of. So I'm, I'm inheriting uh, one of the oldest uh, uh, institutes uh, that's uh, enjoying its 65th birthday uh, of stewardship and legacy. Uh, and I take that very seriously. And it's brought home by this quote that we did not inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrowed from our children. Uh, and it's that sense of uh, stewardship, particularly looking forward to the future of the scientific enterprise and the next generation uh, that grounds me uh, in terms of the decisions we have to make and uh, certainly the decisions you make as part of this uh, council. Uh, and with that sense of legacy and stewardship is a commitment to certain uh, enduring principles that uh, uh, will guide uh, the kind of decisions and priorities that I will set forward. Uh, one is the value and support investigated initiated fundamental uh, discovery science uh, as really uh, a bedrock foundation that I know uh, uh, Eric in this institute has always historically had. Uh, similarly, uh, particularly important for NHLBIs to maintain a balanced uh, cross-disciplinary portfolio that has traditionally spanned, uh, I think relatively nimbly, uh, basic translational clinical and population science. Uh, and I think that balance is critical for the, uh, the constituencies and, and scientific interests that are part of, of our institute. Uh, another element that um, I think is important for the NHLBI as part of its legacy, really, uh, is that part of our congressional authorization, indeed, uh, 
uh, mandates a certain uh, outreach effort uh, in implementation science that empowers patients and providers and systems uh, to ensure that, in fact, we're having a public health impact, again, related to our particular portfolio of heart, lung, and blood. And so we find ourselves more and more in the implementation space than perhaps other institutes. Uh, though, uh, again, I'm, I was excited about uh, the, uh, the app that you guys have uh, uh, for uh, uh, understanding, helping the public to understand genomic science and, and genetics. And uh, Eric knows did in our recent trip with my, my daughter. She was actually giving him all kind of kudos because uh, she's already downloaded the app. Uh, so I think that's actually part of our role uh, as well, is uh, uh, to, to be able to inform the public critically about what we're doing. Indeed, I think that's critical to us sustaining it, particularly in these fiscal challenging times. The other enduring uh, principles are, are related, again, to um, uh, a, an element of the portfolio that I'm particularly passionate about, and that relates to the diversity of the biomedical workforce and that we need to train and nurture uh, this new generation uh, to be the leaders of tomorrow. Similarly, uh, an enduring principle that's particularly a priority for me is that uh, not only do we have public health impact in the United States, but around the globe. And we do that to communities uh, that, quite frankly, um, don't have uh, all of the, uh, the, the, the most optimal health indices that we'd like to see in the, the space of heart, lung, and blood disorders, uh, and to address health inequities. Um, critical to this, and, and this is really the first part of my talk, uh, is the, that stewardship about the next generation. And in that regard, uh, what you see here is a, a pie chart that shows the, the uh, U.S. population here on the left uh, and uh, increasingly becoming demographically diverse uh, as we move forward in this century. Uh, and then the pie chart on the right, uh, you can see our NIHPI grantee distribution. And you'll note uh, that these generous slivers uh, for the population in Hispanics and particularly African Americans the same could be saved for Native Americans, uh, become, uh, go from relatively healthy slivers to tiny little slices that are barely perceptible on the pie chart. And uh, that would be one of the things I think is part of our uh, challenge, uh, but also opportunity moving forward, is to uh, move toward our stewardship of a biomedical workforce uh, that more uh, reflects the diversity of this nation. Um, I, I'm a firm believer uh, that excellent and talent is not ben, uh, bounded by gender, race, or ethnicity, or national origin. Indeed, I would argue that that's what made the United States of America uh, the great nation that it has been uh, over its history, uh, is that we've taken the best and the brightest from around the world. Uh, and uh, I believe firmly uh, that we can uh, pursue excellence. Indeed, our pursuit of excellence will be enabled uh, by ensuring that we tap all the talent uh, in this country, and we have some work to do uh, in that regard. Um, some of it uh, is, has been a, a rude awakening as, as someone who's uh, had his uh, intramural program bounce around to a number of different institutions. Uh, one of the things I found uh, when I arrived here is that uh, my arrival uh, meant a dramatic increase in the proportion of African-American tenured professors uh, or tenured investigators. Uh, in the intramural program. Uh, and so indeed, as the NIH um, uh, ascends to the bully puppet on this issue, uh, we recognize that uh, we have our own sort of glass house challenge uh, in uh, addressing this uh, internally. And uh, although I'm sure many in this audience chuckled, uh, I suspect that as you go back to your own institutions uh, around the country, uh, that uh, these statistics are probably not dissimilar to a lot of the um, the top uh, institutions in this country. And so this is a collective challenge uh, that I think we have as all leaders uh, in this room uh, to ensure that, again, we're tapping all the talent of this diverse nation. And in that regard, um, I've had a little bit of experience in thinking about what it takes to, to grow up a, a generation of minority scientists. I've, I've been blessed uh, in my uh, career uh, to um, uh, encounter some great uh, folks along the way that helped me tremendously. One of the things I've appreciated, and, and this is universal, uh, is that uh, there's some, certain things about 
uh, uh, developing any scientist, and, and it all begins with passion, in my view. Uh, that, that fire in that belly, that, that, that intensity to, to be curious and uh, to, to pursue science, uh, that's critical uh, to success of any scientist. Uh, I actually think uh, that it's almost an article of faith, quite frankly, uh, for minority scientists in particular. Uh, this notion that you're willing to step out into something unknown, that maybe no one in your local circumstance, your family, your neighborhood, has ever even conceived of, as a possibility of a career, uh, in my experience, requires something of a step of faith uh, and uh, a willingness and courage uh, to seize opportunities in that space uh, that's so uncomfortable. Uh, my view is that if there's a underrepresented minority uh, individual who's willing to have that passion, that faith, and seize that opportunity, it's incumbent upon us to match that and meet that with providing that opportunity. Uh, and in that regard, I think uh, uh, that's something that NIH, uh, in its public responsibility of this public good uh, for the nation, uh, is, uh, is somewhat accountable for. Uh, to borrow yet another uh, proverb of uh, an ancient people, that's an African uh, proverb, that it takes a village to raise a child. And uh, I believe that's also pertinent to changing that, that pie chart, uh, that inevitably this involves a collective action uh, of the village, including the people uh, around this table, uh, to, to make a difference uh, in this regard. Um, a, a key element uh, would be mentorship. I, I actually think that that's the determining factor. Certainly has been a determining factor for me and my career trajectory. I wouldn't be here uh, standing before you if it wasn't for a Harvard professor named uh, A. Clifford Barger, uh, who inspired me to even think of doing this, because I had no idea I was going to do that in my first year of Harvard Medical School. Uh, and so I think that's critical, and I think everybody around this room knows how critically important this is. Uh, and finally, the resources to excel. And so one of the, the kudos I have to give uh, Francis uh, Collins uh, as NIH director is that in recognizing this, uh, he put together an ACD working group, and um, as fate would have it, uh, he recruited me to be uh, a member of that working group, uh, and as it turned out, that was a very slick recruitment tool uh, because I, I went from being on the working group uh, to uh, being uh, now on the implementation uh, group uh, as now someone who's, who's transitioned to the inside uh, and the diversity council. Fran Francis is, is a master at these things. Uh, and so uh, part of his initiatives that will come out of the Common Fund uh, relate to trying to address this. And so I hope you will, as leaders, uh, stay tuned uh, for initiatives that are, are, are targeted toward addressing uh, this challenge collectively. Uh, a number of, uh, well, one key one that I hope you will take very seriously to participate on uh, will relate to uh, mentorship and this notion of, of creating uh, a national network uh, and to leverage the fact that we are in a um, a social media and social networking context and figuring out how we can do this more effectively, particularly for um, underrepresented groups uh, that may not have access to the best mentors and mentorship. Now with that, um, uh, I, I do have uh, this notion that this is a, a problem that's been vexing, uh, but uh, I, I have hope. Um, um, and. Uh, uh, there was a time when uh, we didn't think that there would be a monument like this on the mall uh, or that uh, we'd have a president who looks like uh, President Obama. Uh, I, I think at the least uh, the mild medical workforce can make that sort of transformational change occur with a collective leadership. Um, with that on um, uh, the community that we're a part of, uh, let me pivot more uh, toward not only the stewardship of the workforce, uh, but what we'd hope to do in, as stewards of the scientific uh, enterprise uh, moving forward. Uh, that again, uh, I think uh, I'm, I'm privileged and blessed to inherit uh, a great legacy of excellence. Uh, uh, I think it's arguable uh, that Heart Lung Blood uh, has um, been a leader uh, in translating uh, research results and discovery science into major public health impact. 
although the NIH can't take full credit uh, for this declining curve of cardiovascular uh, mortality, uh, clearly uh, it's been a key contributor uh, with scientific discovery. And the challenge really is for us to continue to uh, what we call bend the, bending this curve uh, even further to reduce uh, those events. That this is to me part of what uh, the NIH uh, should have as uh, one of its outcomes. And uh, it's very helpful to, to think about how that success was achieved, at least as a, as a model uh, of how uh, we can move forward uh, over the next 10 years. And just a couple of quick lessons. This is a, uh, a detailed slide, but it's illustrative of the, the success we've had in the cardiovascular area that resonates with me as a cardiologist, in which um, uh, arguably you could say that the population scientists uh, were critical uh, in, in framing uh, the challenge of heart disease, and particularly the, uh, the almost iconic uh, Framingham Heart Study uh, uh, almost invented, I guess practically did invent, the, the term risk factors for disease in identifying cigarette smoking and cholesterol and hypertension uh, as uh, major drivers <laughs> of this. Um, and uh, critical to have that sort of population science within the portfolio. Uh, what it also implies to me is this sort of interaction uh, that has occurred in which population science has often identified certain associations, um, but uh, that gives opportunities for clinical science and basic science to help fill in either the causal links or some of the connections. Uh, and in that regard, uh, I think it was notable that the NIH intramural program uh, had a robust role that uh, pictured here is uh, Don Fredrickson uh, in the intramural program who uh, was actually uh, at the clinical center identifying um, basically clinical phenotypes of, of lipids, uh, the biomarkers of the day, uh, in subcategorizing patients as a means of then doing deeper dives to understand the molecular basis of those clinical phenotypes. And again, there's sort of paradigmatic echoes for what I think we need to do uh, moving forward. Uh, the second piece of this uh, intramural component uh, was again uh, the notion that um, uh, Fredrickson also, uh, as part of his clinical center um, involvement, um, came across a child uh, with these swollen orange tonsils and, and described Tangier's disease. And it was interesting that Eric cited uh, Bill Gall's work uh, in, in looking at uh, rare disorders and how important that uh, has advanced things. And indeed, that is a rare disorder in which now we know the molecular basis of it in terms of um, uh, ABCD uh, transporters. Uh, but all that began uh, within the context of the intramural program and again is a lesson, at least for me, as we move forward to continue to leverage. The third point there is that uh, pictured here are the statmans uh, and it comes back to this concept of stewardship of the next generation uh, and mentorship and the fact that particularly at that point in time the intramural program uh, played uh, a critical role in preparing the next generation. Uh, and indeed, also pictured on this slide are Brown and Goldstein, who need no introduction, and Roy Vagelos, uh, uh, who uh, moved on to, to lead uh, Merck's efforts in this space. And all three of them uh, were fellows uh, in the context of that same intramural program and actually played a critical role to this whole story of how we went from cardiovascular risk factors to changing uh, coronary artery disease, uh, in which uh, uh, the observations in, in population science, the intramural program, fed into basic science laboratories uh, like those at uh, UT Southwestern to come up with the uh, characterization of uh, the LDL receptor, familial hypercholesterolemia, and the, uh, the LDL receptor mutations, HMG co-reductase. Uh, as a target molecule for therapeutics, uh, and, and on and on. Uh, NH, NHLBI then funded clinical trials to translate that into clinical practice, uh, partnered in a complementary fashion, if you will, with private industry, not so much to drive drug discovery, uh, but again to provide the basis for it uh, in basic science discovery and, and, and clinical trials. And finally, implementation science to disseminate an understanding to the public of the importance of cholesterol control that continues to this day. And so I walk through that success story because I think it does uh, uh, provide a paradigm for us moving forward to continue that sort of balance 
an approach and interaction between our various portfolios. Part of the reason why um, I actually did listen to, to Francis uh, and uh, um, take on this position in, in these um, challenging times is because um, of the infectious enthusiasm that I think we all share that at this particular moment in time, uh, we actually have some of the greatest, we're on a threshold of some of the greatest opportunities to pursue. Um, and so despite what's happening uh, or not happening uh, on the Capitol, um, it, there, there's some transformative things happening that this group is very familiar with in the space of uh, systems biology, systems medicine, certainly in our heart, lung, blood space, uh, reparative biology and medicine, uh, regenerative medicine, uh, capabilities to advance predictive health uh, that uh, might actually have us consider uh, the preemption of chronic disease uh, uh, in, in the next couple of decades. Um, the, the promise of, of addressing health inequities in a fundamental way that uh, again spans basic translational clinical and population and community uh, in, a, in an integrated fashion that uh, we couldn't even consider before. And to take that not only locally but globally, uh, we have great opportunities to do that now. And clearly enabled by new tools. Um, again, this, this August group uh, knows more about omic technologies uh, and that I needn't say more, uh, but advances in imaging, uh, informatics, computational biology, uh, stem cells, nanotechnology. And also of, of note here, uh, I'm emphasizing the, the, the connectivity uh, that uh, the digital age brings us uh, to, to create networks that cross disciplines in ways that I think uh, will be transformative uh, uh, that leverages te this technology. And I think this is critical, um, again, in this particular um, moment of time. Uh, again, our, our people's representatives are debating what's going to happen to Medicare costs in 2025 uh, when uh, baby <laughs> boomers like myself uh, are, are, are busting the budget. Uh, and, and this is shown uh, on this slide. Um, certainly one way is to think about making budget cuts to trim benefits and, 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 and limit costs. Uh, but as a clinician scientist, I, I have to be an optimist. That I believe that, uh, that the opportunity is to innovate in ways uh, that, again, can start to bend this curve. And I would argue uh, that uh, the, the medicine that they'll be practicing in 2025 is related to the transformational advances we invest in right now. Uh, and that's really our task, to think about what we can do uh, in discovery science and translational science uh, that can bend this curve that uh, happened to be shown for chronic kidney disease, uh, which is a major consumer of, of Medicare expenditures. But a lot of the other expenditures are also in the, the domain of heart and lung disease. So I think that really part of our charge is to inform this discussion and this debate with at least the possibilities uh, that discovery science uh, may have a role in, in bending the curve and making a difference. In that regard, uh, I think uh, understanding racial inequities gives us a, a, a special prism to try to understand how we might move forward uh, to, to again bend these curves. Uh, these are things that are, uh, this audience is familiar with. Uh, on the left is stroke mortality over the last 60 odd years. The noteworthy things are, again, we're making advances, uh, but uh, a persistent gap exists. Um, the, the red and blue bars are, are African-American ma males and females, uh, and that gap is persistent up to this day. Similarly, on the right-hand panel, you see incident kidney disease, uh, and uh, the top group uh, developing end-stage kidney failure are African-Americans. Uh, so if we can sort of crack this nut and, and, and get at addressing these curves, uh, I think this can be informative of how we can move forward together. And this prism, I think, is noteworthy uh, because it, it emphasizes the fact that at the end of the day, this is a multidimensional, uh, complex, multi-level systems problem uh, in, in, a, in a very fundamental way. Um, now, that could be so vexing that people give up, uh, but the other hand is that this may be precisely the kind of problem that will take the kind of cross-disciplinary uh, and use of tools that are currently at hand. Uh, because it's quite clear when we look at those health inequities uh, that it involves uh, layers that are clearly biological and relate to genomic variation, but also individual in terms of behavior, 
in the framework of a family, in the framework of a community, and with an environment. Uh, and uh, indeed, if we're going to make a difference, uh, we have to think of it in that sort of way of, of complexity. And this is a very busy slide, um, but it, it attempts to try to describe this ecosystem uh, that uh, appears to predispose to these health inequities uh, and that appreciates uh, those uh, endpoints that I described before in stroke and heart failure and kidney failure and our recognition clinically that that's driven by uh, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension is particularly prevalent amongst uh, African Americans that predisposes to these complications. Uh, but it also uh, brings into play um, the notion of the environment uh, and uh, uh, in the era of omics that some are calling the exposome, uh, those, those, those factors in the environment, the, the exposures in the environment that are influencing the predisposition to these risk factors of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension, and a recognition that uh, social dynamics of racism and social deprivation uh, set the stage uh, for the development of a predisposition uh, to these health inequities. Probably most pertinent to, to this group uh, is this notion that we're describing as the biosocial inf interface in which uh, this group in particular is uh, appreciative of that dynamic between uh, environment and, and genomic variation that can influence disease and a potential now uh, for us to have the tools that we look at this interface and uh, we may argue that some of the initiatives of the Genome uh, Institute as well as uh, uh, the Common Fund are starting to look at this interface and, and how we can interrogate it by maybe understanding the microbiome, the immune system, the epigenome as something that might be responsive in a dynamic way uh, to this environment uh, and such that biological systems are uh, altered to drive um, health inequities. At least this is a model uh, to, to pursue and it's one in which uh, we'll, we'll go back and forth in this yin and yang between classical reductionist sorts of, of strategies and more integrative, uh, holistic, cross-disciplinary uh, systems-based approaches. And I think that's one of the exciting opportunities that lays before us. And again, I know that the uh, uh, genome uh, is at the advance and vanguard uh, in uh, leading us through. Um, I, I contextualize this challenge uh, uh, to, by referring back to my former life and the study that we did uh, when I was in Atlanta uh, in which we, we started with a, just a survey, a community-based survey of a biracial uh, ambulatory population, middle-aged in, in uh, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, and uh, this is the sort of classic demographic profile that we got uh, from this group. You can see they're uh, middle-aged and not surprising to you, uh, the African Americans were more obese. Uh, high, higher blood pressures, greater in, uh, prevalence of hypertension, uh, had more diabetes, uh, and of, of note, uh, had less physical activity and lower uh, diet of fruits and vegetables uh, than whites. And, and the thought was that that may drive uh, these uh, health inequities and risk for cardiovascular disease. But what I find intriguing is what we're starting to, to learn about this that I think is relevant uh, to uh, a lot of what uh, uh, this institute uh, is about. Uh, I'm intrigued by the potential uh, to leverage our cohorts uh, and the exposure zone uh, to, to get an understanding of how it, it, it's interfacing at that biosocial interface. And one of the provocative studies uh, uh, done by uh, Chris Kakis uh, uh, and her colleagues using the Framingham uh, database was to look at this phenomenon of social contagion uh, in which um, uh, they followed the Framingham longitudinal uh, cohort uh, and were able to track individuals who started off uh, at about the same time uh, and uh, tracked uh, who became obese and basically who didn't and then mapped that to uh, their social network as shown in the top slide. And the bottom line is that um, your BFF, your best friend forever, uh, when you were younger and both of you were lean, if your BFF became obese, you were more likely to become obese. And it wasn't just that uh, birds of a feather flock together, if you will. There appeared to be a particular, again, social contagion uh, related to uh, that interaction and that affinity. Uh, and so uh, one wonders, well, how would that be interpreted 
at a biosocial interface? What, what might uh, mediate that? And I think that's still speculative, uh, but I guess I'm intrigued by um, animal model data uh, that exists related to the microbiome and how the microbiome is modulated by dietary habits or what you choose to give your mice or rat, and the fact that that is transferable uh, between uh, colonies. And again, this group is aware that if you do a profile of the microbiome, you can actually uh, um, see signatures of the diet uh, there and watch it change uh, with interventions. And so I think this is one of those exciting areas of the biosocial interface that might be very helpful in helping us to understand um, some of these health inequities and how um, the affiliations that come uh, from segregation and, and, and other parts of interactions and how that might, uh, again, have a, a biological mediator uh, at the end of the day. This was also noteworthy uh, because uh, uh, when we studied these African Americans in Atlanta, uh, one of the things that came quite clear is that uh, the low physical activity amongst the African Americans was, was uh, self-evident. But when we asked them the question, do you feel as though it's safe to uh, jog or walk in your neighborhood, disproportionately the African Americans disagreed with that statement. They felt as though their physical activity was indeed influenced by their environment and the feeling uh, that it was unsafe to actually pursue that kind of healthy lifestyle. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, when we looked at where uh, many of them resided here in the southwest quarter of Atlanta and did an analysis of their access to healthy foods, uh, we also recognized that there was a disproportionate concentration of restaurants that serve high fat, high ca calorie dense foods and a relative paucity of supermarkets that uh, provide fresh fruits and vegetables in that same neighborhood. So a, two of the key um, uh, exposure uh, variables uh, may in fact be related to the environment people live in and work in and play in as much as certain individual choices that they're making. Uh, and uh, that again has biological implications. Um, there's some recent work uh, this, uh, from a paper uh, by Wang et al that recognizes that the color that's uh, part of fruits and vegetables um, has uh, relates to chemical products of flavonoid, uh, of flavonoids uh, that uh, are broken down by the microbiome uh, and that the metabolites of those flavonoids uh, then is able to modulate uh, macrophage gene expression, indeed uh, the expression of certain microRNAs that indeed then uh, modulate the expression of transporters involved in lipid metabolism by the foamy macrophages that make up an atherosclerotic lesion. And they were able to, uh, Wang et al. were able to show that manipulating either the metabolite or the microbiome could actually promote the regression of atherosclerosis. And so we're starting to uh, see uh, uh, evidence of how these uh, biosocial interfaces, and, and in this case the microbiome, uh, may be uh, playing a significant role in a way that might be explanatory of certain uh, health inequities that we see. So I, I tried to uh, just paint that picture uh, of some emerging data that I think uh, we find exciting about a path forward, one of which I know that uh, this institute and has already embarked on, it's already in the, the common fund that I hope we can continue uh, to build on. Uh, let me uh, sort of close out with this uh, last example that, again, uh, this body uh, is, is very familiar with, um, that as we look at that social context and how it might interface with biological systems, clearly it's all interacting in the context of, of um, uh, genomic variation and population history that has shaped that genomic variation. And again, I don't need to spend much time on this slide uh, from Carlo Bustamante's work that uh, shows that the mosaic nature of the, the genome, chromosome by chromosome, uh, uh, typically existent in most African Americans that spans different de uh, degrees and extents of uh, admixture of European and African um, uh, lineages. Uh, and how that genome has been shaped uh, by uh, centuries of, of exposures uh, this one giving it just an illustration of malaria and how that has shaped uh, the genome and actually variants uh, that you see uh, here that have been well described. And uh, I, I like this paper as a, as, as a paradigm, hopefully, of, of possibilities in the future 
uh, a paper by Genevieve et al. that I found very provocative uh, and included actually uh, uh, Dr. Kopp, who's here in the intramural program, in which they identified the association of the trypanolytic APOL1 uh, uh, variant uh, in predisposing to chronic kidney disease uh, based on a, a mixture analysis of families with end-stage renal disease uh, done by Friedman and Bowden and others. Uh, and uh, uh, characteristically, um, uh, you can see the, uh, how the heterozygote sort of had an advantage here uh, in that the APOL1 uh, uh, molecule would, would actually lyse the trypanosome uh, that causes uh, sleeping sickness. And so clearly this is something that was uh, probably selected for uh, and was advantageous in that content, uh, context. Uh, and, uh, but now in the context of um, uh, high salt diet uh, uh, in America uh, probably is not so good. And certainly in the context of hypertension increased the risk fivefold. So one of the more uh, robust, actually relatively co common, if you will, variants uh, with a major uh, effect. Uh, on the endpoint and uh, of chronic kidney disease, and it may in fact be driving that that curve that I showed you earlier as to uh, African Americans having a higher uh, incident rate of renal failure, and that to me opens up a lot of exciting opportunities uh, that I hope and I know in fact uh, this institute's interested in pursuing moving forward in the next five to ten years, uh, in which uh, this might uh, serve as something of a paradigm. Um, in which we actually start to contemplate um, the use of uh, markers like an LPO, uh, APOL1 uh, to think about um, uh, ge genomic medicine therapeutic strategies uh, and or uh, as a discovery platform, if you will, uh, for new therapies, new pathways, and pathogenic mechanisms of chronic kidney disease. Uh, one could imagine um, uh, clearly playing a role in risk prediction. Uh, influencing therapeutic choices, the degree, the lowering of the blood pressure, the strategy of lowering the blood pressure, and as I say, identify novel pathways that will give us some insight as to what indeed promotes the progression of chronic kidney disease. It seems so inexorable. So I'm excited actually by the opportunities uh, to bend this curve uh, and to uh, have an impact in which we might actually be transformative and the drivers of Medicare expenditures moving forward, if we could indeed identify a risk population, develop a strategy that's actually preemptive uh, in the development of this end-stage disease in a way that uh, would be transformative to the patients and actually uh, may actually uh, uh, be transformative in terms of our, our economic imperatives. So I see a lot of opportunities for uh, NHLBI and Genome to, to work in partnership. Uh, we share. Uh, a, a common interest in the emergence of, of big data, and uh, uh, we're clearly committed to converting what is a storage problem uh, into an opportunity to to uh, have, uh, to develop actionable knowledge that actually drives uh, medicine and public health impact. Um, I'm, I'm always uh, I always chuckle as as a clinician. Um, you know, I still remember those days of you know going down to the medical record room and and waiting in a queue and waiting for someone to disappear back into the stacks and bring you back a, a bunch of charts this full from, you know, Mary Sue in for her 12th admission. Um, and so um, when I go on the web, um, I, I, it's just remarkable how much we've lagged behind the digital revolution of the 21st century in biomedicine. And so uh, when I go to Amazon.com, it says, hi, Gary. And uh, here's my actual screenshot. You guys are probably discerning and doing a psychological analysis of the books I read, uh, but uh, suffice it to say, prior to Christmas, it you know suggested the new uh, Jefferson biography because I like biographies, uh, and um, I, I actually did buy it based on that uh, that recommendation. Enjoyed it uh, over Christmas, uh, and yet it's all because they're they're tracing my behaviors, all my transactions, all my things, that, and they're able to develop algorithms to predict what I probably would buy. Uh, for myself, and it just seems so incredibly um, uh, humbling that medicine seems so far uh, from what Amazon uh, is doing. Uh, I also, uh, like some of you in the room probably, uh, would, would follow uh, 538 and, and Nate Silver and, uh, you know, how he's able to take uh, metadata and, 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 and make so much uh, inference out of it and 
be pretty close to predicting things pretty good. Uh, and so uh, I'm hopeful uh, that uh, that's something that we can do uh, in the context of our, our enterprise. Uh, and with that regard, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, we can think about rebooting uh, Framingham. Uh, I say this with caution with Terry Manolio in the room, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, we think about Framingham 2.0 indeed. Uh, actually, uh, during uh, the time before uh, genome stole her away from NHLBI, for which we'll never forgive genome, uh, that uh, Framingham was starting to move in that, uh, that direction. And uh, I think uh, uh, was amongst the early cohorts that adopted genomic uh, analyses and technology. And I think uh, we have an opportunity now in uh, version 2.0 to, to even leverage that further. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, folks from this institute uh, will give us some ideas uh, because um, I think it's still relatively untapped uh, how, about how much we're using the fact that it's been such a multi-generational study for over 50 years. Um, and uh, we have these platforms, we have the uh, next-gen sequencing capabilities, we have deep phenotyping uh, literally on hundreds of, uh, of, of families, um, and uh, I'm hopeful that we can exploit that. Uh, in a much more uh, strategic and effective and high-impact way than perhaps we, we have using some of the older uh, sort of platforms. And I think it's quite amenable to that. And we'd love to talk to you about how we might uh, work on that together. Uh, similarly, we're expanding the notion of, of omics uh, to in include uh, a variety of, of, of platforms that are already embedded uh, within uh, that in which we hope to enrich, uh, including um, IPS cells, et cetera. So uh, I think that the opportunities are great uh, to leverage one of the, the iconic legacies of, uh, of the NHLBI. Uh, I'm hopeful that we can work with you uh, toward this concept of, of a scientific commons, if you will, uh, that taps into the collective intelligence of the whole community and leverages across a variety of disciplines by, again, making more data at multiple levels publicly available, not just the DNA sequence, but uh, at the various levels, all the way up through uh, the phenotype and the expososome. Uh, at least that's what we would envision um, in, in partnership with, with this institute uh, in a way that captures the diversity of, of our cohorts, uh, but also starts to bring in uh, our clinical um, uh, colleagues, uh, the fact that we have clinical trial networks and clinical research networks that also have these capabilities to extend beyond the, the, the community-based uh, cohorts to expand our case ascertainment uh, and, and therefore controls as well. Uh, we're hopeful that uh, with the scientific commons, uh, we cr can indeed collectively uh, create this open, uh, uh, multi-dimensional omic data repositories that again is accessible. Uh, to, to more scientists than just a close group of uh, investigators that might have been a part of these original uh, cohorts. Uh, and uh, I, I'm very hopeful and perhaps overly optimistic about the future, uh, but um, I, I uh, was very intrigued by uh, one of the meetings I went to when I first uh, started uh, on this um, uh, bench to bassinet uh, working group and, and network that we have in our pediatric cardiology uh, group that uh, Gail uh, Pearson and uh, Jonathan Kaufman have been leading uh, that has gotten together a series of investigators uh, um, who are, are, are probing congenital heart disease as, as something where we might be able to, again, um, uh, leverage uh, uh, clinical ascertainment, uh, advances in imaging type uh, uh, technology, and uh, the application of omics to understand potentially the role of de novo mutations in certain pathways that might predispose uh, to a defect and, and understand that uh, not only at this clinical level, uh, but that uh, may relate to other uh, biological systems, mouse models, et cetera, uh, with the use of IPS cells uh, and characterize um, advances in our understanding of congenital heart disease in a way that would be unprecedented. Um, just go past that. Uh, and finally, uh, the, the other thing I think would be very exciting uh, to work with this group on uh, relates to genomic medicine, as we alluded to, that um, they're a great opportunity that, again, uh, Genome has played a leadership role on. I know Terry's been in this space uh, with Emerge and genomic medicine and clinical sequencing 
that I hope that we can build on uh, in the context, uh, again, uh, in a complementary way that extends what we're doing at Framingham and cohorts, but closer to the clinic and clinical phenotyping, uh, where we can, again, leverage that linkage between uh, information that's already there in electronic records, but increasingly is having uh, genomic uh, information superimposed in repositories that are happening around the country. And already in our cardiovascular research network in the NHLBI, we, you know, we have millions of, of covered lives uh, through the uh, health plan systems that are already part of this network. So when you talk about big data um, uh, and tracking of outcomes, I think this is an incredible platform uh, that uh, gives us enormous opportunity. And uh, I'd love to be able to su superimpose uh, our CTSA network on this and, and to pursue things more in this, pers uh, this direction of genomic medicine. So what I've tried to, to indicate to you uh, are some opportunities uh, that I think are unprecedented, and at least I'm excited about, uh, that we can uh, work together on. Um, and uh, I've, I've put out this challenge uh, to uh, uh, our staff, and uh, I, I probably was crazy enough to, uh, to do it in my first invited plenary at the American Society of Hematology. Um, I, I probably should have asked you, Eric, first whether that was a good idea or not. Uh, but I, I, I showed this slide uh, to this group of hematologists as a cardiologist uh, because uh, one of the things that I encountered when I was in Atlanta is Atlanta has one of the biggest sickle cell clinics uh, in the country. And uh, as an adult cardiologist, it, 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 it had not been hit home to me, um, the fact that so many of our kids with sickle cell disease suffer strokes uh, at a very early age. Uh, this nation was kind of rocked by what happened in, in, in Newtown, Connecticut with the, uh, the, the, the murder of, of six-year-old children. Uh, and I must admit, as tragic and, and, and as horrendous as that is, uh, I think it's also tragic uh, that we have uh, African-American children with sickle cell disease uh, who are having strokes uh, literally on a weekly basis who are six years old. Um, we, we've made advances, uh, that's what's shown on this slide, with a clinical trial that the NHLBI funded in which transfusing blood made a difference. But uh, it was seen to me uh, ambitious uh, but feasible goal to set for ourselves that we would think about a, a stroke-free generation of children uh, with sickle cell disease. And I say this to this audience because um, this was the paradigmatic molecular medicine disease. This was the disease where we figured out the mutation a long time ago, uh, and yet six-year-olds are having stroke. Uh, again, I don't need to tell this audience. Uh, there are probably some opportunities we can pursue to figure this out. Some of those have already been made in the case of cystic fibrosis. I think the time is right to, to make that happen in sickle cell disease, not only in this country, but around the globe. And I think that we have an unprecedented opportunity to do that uh, with things we have in hand. And with that, I appreciate your attention. I'm certain Gary is happy to answer questions that council members may have. Uh, I, I wanted to follow up on the comments you made about um, minority representation in the research workforce. There, there's been this ongoing debate or discussion about pipeline versus um, falling out of the pipeline. And, and I look now at things like the Mark Scholar Program that, that is funded, I guess, primarily by NIGMS, which seems to go down perhaps to the undergraduate level, but not below. And, and I'm wondering whether you would be interested in commenting on, first of all, what, you, what your view is of the pipeline issue, and second of all, how can we overcome this chasm between K through 12 education and then the undergraduate and above it? It seems like it's two completely different worlds. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great point, uh, great comment. and. Uh, uh, if this was a readily solvable problem, I think we would have solved it by now. Um, it, 
at the risk of sounding like someone downtown, uh, you know, it, it probably is one of those all the above kind of challenges. Uh, uh, just saw an article in the New York Times this Sunday uh, about uh, um, a town in, in New Jersey in which um, they start at preschool. And, you know, all of us have kids. Uh, we've been blessed that they've gone on. Well, we started very early to put them on these trajectories. So I agree with you. You probably can't start early enough. Uh, you could argue, given what we already know, a lot of it's even in utero for all we know. So you can't start early enough. Uh, so then I think we had a, a challenge as the working group to say, wh wh where's the, the best, most targeted strategic place for NIH to play a role, recognizing that, quite frankly, you know, there's a whole Department of Education, et cetera, uh, and there's a lot of players that should be in this space. So that's where we had to make a judicious, strategic uh, decision about where we could do the most from an NIH perspective. And we came down a little close to what you said, and that is, um, although there are challenges all the way through, that when you look at the incoming freshmen, even into college, um, the underrepresented groups are still a pretty healthy number of those who at least intend to go toward the biological sciences, even those who make it through to that point. Uh, then what we looked at was uh, from undergraduate converting a graduate BS to a PhD. That's where we saw a steep decline and where um, there was a dramatic gap now in, in terms of those who made that conversion. And that kind of led us to say, if we again don't have unlimited resources or un unlimited leverage, what could we do? We tried to hit that conversion. One of the programs, and again, it's not sufficient, but one of the programs relates to, to reducing um, one of the disincentives, which is the financial burden that comes from taking this track, particularly after you've built up uh, the debt of college education. And as having gotten three kids through, uh, I have an immediate appreciation for how much that is. That the days of working your way through college uh, for a low-income person are, are rapidly disappearing, if not already gone. So the notion of putting in uh, a scholarship and or loan repayment option to at least reduce that uh, 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 roadblock or hurdle, uh, particularly targeted at these groups in conjunction with what is already there in terms of market and what have you, we thought could make a difference. And then the second one is the one I described, which is the mentorship. Uh, that is to, to, to link those kids in. That, if that drop off is not because, we want to be sure it's not because they didn't have opportunities and they didn't get the best guidance. And that's again what we're going to need to folks around the table. I have an institute question for you. One of the things that we struggle with is where does NHGRI start and stop compared to the other institutes? And I, I know there's, it's a continuum and there is no start and stop, but our advisory role is for one institute, but often our scope of interest and uh, the opportunity is across the, the spectrum. And as you're uh, new and in one of the, the great partner institutes, I wonder if you could comment on how you see things uh, playing together. Uh, well, probably because I am new and I'm coming from outside the NIH, um, I, I see that, um, the importance of uh, uh, the collaborative synergies that potentially can exist here. Uh, I think we're in a fiscal climate where if there ever was a situation where each institute could go alone, uh, that's rapidly disappearing. Uh, so I think the, the reality of the situation is uh, when things are tight, we really have to, to look for those collaborative synergies. Uh, again, uh, I can't speak for Eric, but um, I would hope that we can work collectively um, in platforms that I believe are, in essence, disease agnostic. You, you might have noticed, for example, that I actually gave you a kidney example. Um, we did there, there was, uh, it, it, it's probably the rebel in me that, um, uh, you know, hypertension is in our portfolio, kidney disease is in Griff's portfolio. But, um, uh, I, we, we, we're having collaborative talks because obviously when it comes to patients, they don't care about these things. And when it comes to the science, 
this institute, probably more than any, um, is interested in platforms and scientific questions that are clearly so cross-cutting and yet fundamentally important uh, for us. So, so I think in terms of the resources that we talked about and the platforms, I, I see great opportunities uh, for us to continue to collaborate. And, you know, and Eric and I are, uh, you know, been, been going back and forth on this, so. I think they're ready Anybody? for lunch. <laughs> okay. Well, thank, thank you, you, Gary. Appreciate it was wonderful it. to be continued. Rudy, do you want to uh, give the marching orders? The orders are to go upstairs one floor and seek food. And um, you can also, aside from eating in the cafeteria, you may want to connect with uh, some of the program directors of HG, go to their offices. There's a conference room on the fourth floor that has a, a large room and, and seating there as well. Please be back at 1.15, okay? We'll reconvene at that time.